Okay, the plan for the rest of the day, just so you know, this is our final panel on uh, legal perspectives. Uh, and then we were going to go right into uh, open uh, summary remarks from Steve Gorlick, and then we'll have a, a Q&A free-for-all, uh, as long as everybody, uh, no throwing chairs, and uh, we should be fine. So uh, this panel, uh, of all the, uh, the uh, moderators, they were drawn because they have some particular expertise that uh, gave them some authority to speak on the uh, panel. Alleged. Well, alleged. Well, that's true, alleged. Uh, and of course, for this panel, we, we ran out of experts. And so uh, I have uh, no authority uh, other than having watched a, a lot of TV shows uh, <laughs> and uh, been sued once to, uh, uh, to do it. But it's in, in many ways, it's a very, uh, well, it is a very auspicious uh, panel. Uh, and let me uh, introduce them without further delay. Uh, and uh, you very seldom get a chance to say ripped from the headlines, but uh, in this case, I think it's the only time I've ever been able to say it, and it's accurate, uh, is, of course, Norman Siegel. Um, and, uh, and Sally, you're going to have to, uh, there's no physical demonstrations of right affection, of affection. <laughs> a lot of the panelists. Uh, and so Norman, if, if you don't know, is, is very noteworthy. Uh, he just finished a, uh, uh, a, a, a murder trial. Uh, successfully, and uh, also represented the uh, the uh, Eboliners uh, in Maine, um, and uh, thankfully uh, that uh, went well, I think, and, and he could certainly opine on it. And she's healthy, and um, and so he's well known as a civil rights and civil liberties lawyer. Um, he's a graduate of the Brooklyn uh, Brooklyn College and NYU School of Law. Uh, he began in 1968 with the uh, ACLU, um, the Southern Justice and Voting Law Project. And, um, and he's been involved in civil rights and civil liberties issues since that time. Uh, he was executive director of the New York uh, Civil Liberties Union uh, starting in 1985. And um, for the next 15 years, he was uh, doing battle with the uh, city of New York. Um, after 9-11, he was uh, instrumental, as, as we've heard this morning, um, in a lot of the efforts, uh, particularly the joining with the uh, uh, skyscraper safety campaign and the litigation against the city for release of the uh, uh, 911 tapes. Um, he's uh, presently uh, uh, in the, uh, his firm, um, uh, uh, Siegel, Teitelbaum, and Evans, uh, which handle a wide variety of legal issues, including civil rights and civil liberties, and we're happy to have him here today. Um, to his right is uh, Daniel Clow. Uh, he's from uh, Hartford, Connecticut, the offices of uh, McElroy, Dutch, Mulvaney, and Carpenter. He focuses primarily on First Amendment issues and media law. He's also an adjunct faculty at the University of Connecticut Law School, where he teaches privacy law. Uh, he's frequently quoted on First Amendment and privacy issues, author of numerous articles and columns on appellate practice and First Amendment issues, and uh, he's immediate past president of the Connecticut Foundation for Open Government and has received numerous awards for his work on behalf of government access and transparency, including the Society of Professional Journalists 2009, Helen M. Loy Freedom of Information Award, the Connecticut Council on Freedom of Information's 2007 Stephen Collins Award, and the Connecticut Bar Association's 2007 Pro Bono Award. So as you see, he's uh, uniquely uh, qualified and confident on these issues. And, uh, and to his right um, is uh, in a panel of great people, uh, a, uh, a even uh, more storied and uh, impressive background, the uh, Honorable George Bundy Smith, Sr. Uh, he's a retired judge for the New York State uh, Court of Appeals. Um, he's the uh, had 14-year term on the Court of Appeals. Uh, he's currently working on uh, alternative dispute resolution. And in fact, uh, he's one of the only panelists that uh, the Center on uh, uh, Dispute Resolution uh, saw our publicity and they were excited that uh, the judge was going to be here and so uh, they said oh let this send, send this out to our members as well so we didn't even uh, know he was famous in that realm. Um, he's spent his life committed to the pursuit of justice. Uh, he's received uh, uh, myriad awards uh, and since 2006 he's uh, a partner in the national and international law firm of Chad Bourne and Park where he specializes in arbitration, mediation, commercial disputes, estates, property, appeals and trials. Um, and uh, he was a sitting uh, justice uh, for the uh, uh, 911 uh, tapes case uh, brought by the New York Times and uh, joined by uh, Norman Siegel. So uh, with that, I think uh, Daniel Clow is going to make some uh, opening remarks. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a privilege to be part of such a terrific panel. Uh, Norman and I were talking, and I, I thought it would be useful to give you a 90-second primer, basic primer on freedom of information, to sort of put some of the more substantive comments we'll make in context. Um, you know, uh, our government has three branches, both state and federal, usually three branches, executive, legislative, and judicial. The Constitution, the federal Constitution, op uh, guarantees open courts, public trials. But there's nothing in the Constitution that says the executive branch has to show the public what it's doing. There's nothing in the Constitution that says uh, that the legislature really has to be in, in public. So freedom of information laws are creatures of statute. And generally, they arise in response to some great crisis. And the crisis that gave rise to most contemporary freedom of information laws was Watergate. Um, I think it was uh, the now mayor of, of um, Chicago who uh, once said, a good crisis is a terrible thing to waste. And the only thing good that might have come out of Watergate is it, it uh, inspired governments around our country, state, local, and federal, to pass meaningful freedom of information laws. Now, what do they do? Tom Robbins on the previous panel said it, I think, quite simply. They establish a presumption. The government's records are the people's records. And any person, for any reason, can go in and ask to see a government document, a public record, and then the burden is on the government to point to some exemption that would justify discl uh, withholding disclosure. So that presumption is very important. That's what the law says. I see a little laughter because it doesn't necessarily work that way in reality. But that the law says that the public has a presumption of access to these documents and the burden is on the government. So what you have are fights over when, what kinds of exemptions should you have. Um, and you know, the list of exemptions grows longer and longer under the Federal Act and the State Act. You're, there are usually exemptions for law enforcement to keep information from disclosure while there's a pending law enforcement action. There are exemptions for you know, national security documents and, um, and, and, lo and lots of other things. What there frequently isn't is a general privacy exemption. Or when there is, it's language that we've heard today a document shouldn't be released un, um, if it would uh, release, uh, result in an unwarranted breach of privacy so, or an invasion of privacy. And that's what leads to the debate in specific cases about the public's interest in disclosure versus um, a, a victim or a family member of a victim having to suffer uh, the, the trauma if you will, of having information that may be very personal, emotional, released. And it's the struggle to balance that that really is, I think, at the heart of this program. The only thing I want to say on that, and then I will be quiet, is this. Um, it is impossible, in my opinion, absolutely impossible to design a legal rule, you know, a statute, a regulation, that defines perfectly when information is sufficiently private that it should outweigh the public's interest or vice versa. You cannot have a perfect rule. It's beyond our capacity as humans. So what do you do if you know that it's impossible to design a perfect rule? You have to err one way or the other. And in the First Amendment context, the Supreme Court has said repeatedly, we're going to err on the side of more speech. When we design our rules addressing uh, defamation, for example, we're going to set them up so that we err in the side of more speech. That means that, means that there is a, going to be a cost at times. Someone is going to be defamed, and the defamer is going to get off the hook because we are erring on the side of more speech. I think the same thing is true in this privacy versus public disclosure context. 
we have to decide which way we're going to err. Personally, I think that history teaches us you need to err in the side of more disclosure even though that at times will exact a very real, tangible cost on individuals whose privacy is invaded. I'm not saying everything should be open to the world 100%. I am saying that I think designing a system where you err in favor of more disclosure rather than less is the way to go. Okay, thank you. Uh, Judge, do you have any initial thoughts? Well, I agree almost entirely with uh, the uh, first speaker. I think he's right on the money. I think you should err on the side of freedom. These things are going to uh, come out. On the other hand, I think if there is something that's private and people will say, well, I do not... People will say, I do not want this to come out. Um, I have a member of my family, they would say, who has been raped, uh, who doesn't want it to come out. I don't think that should come out. And for that reason, in choosing juries, if there is something that may be embarrassing or very private to a person, you call that person up to the bench and ask him or her, what is it? And you may even excuse that person because of privacy concerns. So while you try to err on the side of divulging these things, I think you've got to also uh, err on the side of privacy. Okay, Norman. Well, before I begin, I want to uh, thank uh, Charles and Glenn and others for inviting me here. Uh, it's an honor to be on this panel with Charles and Daniel, but especially to be with the judge. Uh, you're seeing someone who, in my opinion, is a great American. Uh, I first learned about George Bundy Smith when he was at Yale Law School, which in my opinion is the best law school in America. And he left there to be a freedom writer. Uh, back, if I remember, 1961. Uh, and I've always admired the people who rode those buses in order to bring to attention to America the racism in Alabama, Mississippi, et cetera, and to take that risk that you're going to leave school and a pre prestigious school. Uh, I've always thought those people were very special Americans. Uh, this judge here, uh, with his intelligence, his compassion and passion, as you'll hear, uh, I'm sure during the next 45 minutes on this panel. Uh, he's a hero to me. And uh, if we had more judges like George Bundy Smith in the system, there'd be a lot less cynicism, a lot less alienation, and we really would achieve justice and fairness for all. So thank you for all thank your you. good work. <laughs> now that doesn't make him perfect. <laughs> And on this case, I'm going to try again today to win his vote over. <laughs> uh, on the case, New York Times, uh, Catherine Regenhart et al., there were seven other families in addition to the Regenhart family, the Santoros who are here, were part of that historic lawsuit. Uh, let me put that in context. Uh, there were three distinct items that we were trying to get. First, the 911 calls. And that was calls from people within the buildings, uh, potentially people from outside the building, uh, on the uh, 911 emergency system. And the result of the litigation it was in the Supreme Court, the Appellate Division, and then to the Court of Appeals, where there are seven judges. Uh, we won some of the things. We didn't win everything. The vote was four to three. Uh, and the result was that on those tapes, the operator's voices could be disclosed. Second, the eight families, the Reaganharts, the Santoras, and the other six families, their voices or their loved ones' voices could be released because they waived the privacy. In retrospect, when I was reading the case again last night, 
maybe we made a mistake in not organizing to get the other families to affirmatively waive their right in order to have those documents released because as I'll mention before here, and let me jump to it right away, once again, the government decided that they speak for the families. There was no evidence in the record that the other families did not want the information to be released. The majority said that we know that there's eight families, but we don't know that the other families uh, want it to be released or not to be released. So in the absence of ev evidence to the question, the city of New York took the position that the other families did not want, and the court, the majority, went along with that. The current fight that we're fighting, and we won't rest on this fight, because we've learned, is that they're doing the same thing now about the human remains at the museum. They take the position that they know what the families want. They take the position that they speak for those families. There's no evidence to that. In fact, we've done some surveys of our own, and 95% of the families, at least 300 families that we've been able to contact, don't want the human remains to be placed 70 feet below ground at this 9-11 museum, and yet, where are the remains? They're there. So, in retrospect on this issue, maybe we should have, and we still could, get families to waive their rights so that if their loved ones are on the 911 phone uh, system, we get it. Footnote there. If any of us around come September 11, 2028, we should all meet because, and looking at this room, some of us will make it. <laughs> Maybe a few of us won't be there. Let's see, 28, what are we now? 14th, that's 14 more years, and I might not be here. So, oh, no. so somebody else got to carry this on. And the reason there is there's an agreement that all these documents that we didn't get will be released. Uh, they're keeping it for 25 years. So we're about halfway there. Uh, so for those of you who are young enough or healthy enough, remember September 11th, 2028, because we need those documents for some of the reasons we said before. Now the majority wrote, oh yeah, and so it's not okay to the others. So all those other uh, people on those uh, 911 uh, calls, we don't know what they were saying. Uh, the bottom line, and I'll quote the court, we conclude that the public interest in the words of the 9-11 callers is outweighed by the interest in privacy by those family members and callers who prefer those words to remain private. There's a terrific dissent. Uh, three judges dissented, and they took the position that the public interest uh, was more important than the privacy interest, and they also recommended, as you heard in the previous panel, well, there was a middle ground. Rather than giving out the tapes, give out a transcript of the tapes, because that could be less hurtful or painful for people. But the majority didn't go there. I would imagine there were discussions in the court, uh, but we never got that part. Uh, the second area was the dispatch calls. And that was communications within the fire department personnel. So department dispatches and other department employees. And the court rightfully, in my opinion, took the position, well, they're public employees. Their privacy rights are a little different than the public itself. And they released these tapes to the extent that they consisted of factual statements or instructions affecting the public. And that language comes from New York's Freedom of Information Law, that uh, if it is factual and it's instructions affecting the public, the public has a right to know, because as Dan said, the great part about FOIL and its theory is the government's business is we the people's business. And they said that they would redact non-factual material opinions and recommendations. And here, it appeared the court was, and maybe the judge could elaborate on it, that there was a concern for the employees' opinions on the tape that should not be made public. My position is that that information should have been released because, again, they're public employees. 
and therefore if they're on the public uh, dispatch system, that information should not be by definition private. And finally, the third part was the oral histories. Fire department called people in, they interviewed people. Most important, there was no promise of confidentiality. So anyone who was being interviewed wasn't promised that this would not be made public. In fact, the court said the majority, quote, spoken words recorded for the benefit of prosperity. So they disclosed this under FOIL, and they made one exception, too. And they said if it would cause pain or embarrassment to interview UEs if disclosed. So if someone was saying something, and they said something that if it made became public, they would be embarrassed or pained. Uh, I disagree with that because they were on notice that what they were saying was part of their job and whatever they said should have been made public. So in summary on those three parts, we in fact got a lot of what we wanted, but we didn't get everything. And the dissent said that it was important to have all the information. Now, if Charles, the moderator, and other people want, I can do the following. I went last night into my archives, and Your Honor, I have my binder that I presented to you and the other six. The Court of Appeals is a wonderful room. And the nicest thing about the Court of Appeals, the podium is so large that you can put your kitchen sink, you can put everything you want on that podium, and you can hold it. I know the first time I was there, I was like that, because it's a very prestigious group of people, even today, but not as prestigious when you were there, in my opinion. And it's a wonderful experience for a lawyer to be up in Albany in that room. So. If you want, I can read a little of what I was trying to persuade all of them, including this guy, uh, of the point. Should I do some of that, or you want to do uh, something? I'm else? not going to get between you and this, so uh, <laughs> let's let's go, <laughs> to, to judge you. I'll do you it for get a ready. few minutes. If you want, you can respond. Uh, I start off the materials at issue here, the ones that I just mentioned, comprise an invaluable historical record of what transpired on September 11, 2001. The family members want to learn all that they can about what occurred on 9-11 so that they can uncover information about the last moments of their loved ones' lives. But in addition, they believe disclosure of these materials will provide the public with vital information regarding the management and effectiveness of rescue operations and safety in high-rise buildings. Exactly what the Christian Reagan Heart Center is all about. What went wrong, but also what went right on that day. Disclosure will assist and stimulate efforts to build safer buildings and plan more effective rescue operations so that in the event of a future similar terrorist attack, God forbid, the loss of life will be minimized. As family member Catherine Reaganhart has stated, I had to use Catherine because that's her legal name. And if you're in court, you can't put nicknames or whatever. I'm going to serious. No, I, I didn't talk about your age yet. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> we, we need to learn. We need, this is her quote, and it's terrific. We need to learn how the problems that emerged during September 11th can be fixed and firefighters like my son Christian can save people next time there's a catastrophic event. If you are ignorant of the past, you are condemned to the past. If what happened on September 11 is shrouded in secrecy, we can never make any improvements. The 9-11 Commission report states, quote, although Americans may be safer, they are not safe. For Americans to be safe, it is crucial to uncover and analyze what transpired on 9-11. We need to look backwards to look forward. Without disclosure of all the information of what actually occurred, we're in no better position to protect ourselves in the future, a theme that recurs over and over again. This court, seven of you, above, have the power to release the information sought on this appeal. If you do not, the vital information will remain sealed 
for at least 25 years pursuant to an agreement between New York City and the 9-11 Commission. Who gave the city permission to seal all of this for 25 years? Did they ask any of you for your opinion of whether you wanted to seal it? Of course not. But that's the way they operate. They think that they know what's best for us. The family members that I represent hope something positive can come from this horrific attack, needing building safety and more efficient and effective rescue operations. The Respondent City of Fire Department has so far deprived the public of the benefit of the requested information through, we submit, intolerably strained and expansive constructions of the exemptions to FOIL. I actually got a little eloquent there. We further submit that none None of the fire department's arguments resisting the disclosure of the contested documents is supportable under FOIL. So that's just a little. I'm not going to go on with all of it, although I'd like reading what I wrote 10 years ago and did. But the main point here is, I think Dan touched upon it, we have to recognize that in a constitutional democracy, which we have, that when the government is doing certain things, if we believe that they're doing it unconstitutionally or even wrongfully, we the people need to speak up. If we don't speak up, the government's going to continue, in my opinion, to trample on our rights. And speaking up can be as simple as in a room like this, on questions and answers, you get up to the mic and you tell us what you think, writing a letter to the editor, uh, holding a sign, and picketing, or as the Santoros recently did, they put some, uh, you know, stuff around their mouth uh, when they were trying to make the point that on the decision on 9-11 human remains, they were being gagged. No one was asking them. That picture went internationally, went all over the world, and people began to understand that. And I've seen those pictures, that same tactic being used by other people and other nations all around the world. And then finally, if that all doesn't work, which I always consider the court of public opinion, there are lawyers out there who are prepared and are skilled to bring the kind of litigation uh, to present it to the judiciary. And on the judiciary, I want to say from my experience in the South in the 60s and 70s, and up south now in places like New York or even recently in Maine, really up south, there are judges like George Bundy Smith who are there who believe in these principles of freedom and justice and quality for all. And I believe, I remember when I once went to Justin William O. Douglas to stop the bombing of Cambodia by the Nixon administration because the Constitution says you can't go to war against countries unless Congress declares war. Article 116, but Nixon decided he was going to do it anyway. And there are judges out there, I believe, who are waiting for those kinds of cases because they believe in that role. And the courts play the safety valve. When the executive branch of government and the legislative branch of government, because of the politics, their fear about not being reelected, their fear that the majority of the people will oppose if they do the right thing lack of leadership for sure, but when they don't do the right thing, the independent judiciary is the place to go. Now that doesn't mean you win it all the time. It doesn't mean like in our case, we didn't win everything we wanted, but we won a lot. And even though I'm critical of the majority decision, the majority decision gave us certain information and wrote precedent with regard to the importance of FOIL. So the message here is you have a role in that constitutional democracy. If you don't speak up, it won't happen. If you don't speak up, your rights will evaporate. And once you lose them, you ain't getting them back. So the message here is participate, be informed, and fight for your rights. Thank you. Let me ask, so let me ask both of, the, of, of my uh, colleagues on the, the panel a question. Um, brass tax. As lawyers, we tend to deal often at, uh, with generalities, rules, which are abstractions. But at a certain point in time, in a particular case, like the one Norman was described, you have to apply this abstract principle 
to a specific case. So here's my question for you, all right? There's uh, a woman on one of the, I can't remember which floor of the tower, and she's on a 911 call with her cell phone, and she's describing how hot it is. I'm dying, the heat, it's, it's getting, help me, help me, help me. And, and these are her last words. And a request is made for that tape where she says who she is, she describes in extraordinary um, emotion the pain she's in, her fear, and you almost can hear her die on the phone. Is that a tape that should be disclosed in response to a Freedom of Information, a FOIL request? I think that um, after the event, histories ought to be made public. People know that those events are going to be made public because it's the oral history and it will prevent uh, hopefully similar things happening in the past. Now in 1948, I'm 77 years of age now, but in 1948 I was living in Washington DC and I went down to see Harry S. Truman uh, get inaugurated. And there he was in an open automobile, waving to the crowd. His World War II buddies were all there, waving to the crowd, and everybody was cheering him on. That could not happen today. I believe that things have changed so much that even a Mitt Romney, and, and I am a, um, a uh, Democrat, have been all my life, although my mother was a Republican, I think even a Mitt Romney, or the Vice President for um, uh, the uh, second George Bush, ought to have protection. They ought to be protected, and if they want to use their own money, um, that's fine. They can use their own money. Now, the specific question, this uh, woman is dying, her last words. If the family says, we want that protected, I'm going to listen to the family. Uh, if there are similar stories and they say we want it out, then I think they ought to come out. So that, uh, that's, that's my simple answer to the question. Well, my, my answer would be you disclose the tape and at a minimum you redact the woman's name and the personal information. To some great extent, we don't need to know who the person was who was making that statement, but we need to know that they were making the statement uh, because we then can also take that statement, perhaps, and we have the statement where someone says, stay in your place. But then it makes sense. Why were people saying, stay in your place? Wasn't there some kind of script prepared for this kind of tragedy? And if not, was it negligence on the part of the Giuliani administration? And is there a script now, if God forbid something happened? What about the people who are the 911 operators? Were they told that morning what they should be saying? We know that there were people saying, go to the roof even though you couldn't get to the roof. We know that most of the people said stay in place. Only few people told them the right thing, get the hell out as quickly as you can. So just getting one part of the conversation doesn't really add to it. Uh, and, and I understand what the judge is saying, but at the same token, the law on the foil talks about the right of privacy to the subject party. Now, the majority disagreed with us on that point where we argued that the privacy right 
only belong to the person, not to the family members. Once you open up that door legally, that it's not just me, but my mother, my father, my wife, my sister, my brother, oh God, they'll do things totally contrary to what I want to do. And so that's a legal issue as well. But the bottom line, stuff like that and almost everything, I think it should be disclosed. And finally, and the, the dissent made a good point, uh, and they did it. Remember when uh, Nasser sent up uh, one of those uh, uh, satellites and it blew up? Uh, in that case, the court in D.C. said, we're not going to disclose the tapes themselves, but we'll give the transcript of what people were saying in those last moments, because that minimizes the, the pain, the hurt, uh, and we could have done that here as well, in my opinion, but we did not. That raise, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. It raises an interesting point about the role of technology. Yeah, that's correct. The role of technology. And I think one of the reasons we are so sensitized to these privacy issues in the 21st century is because uh, the internet and social media makes it possible to take something like the conversation we were just describing or a picture and put it out there permanently on the World Wide Web for eternity for everybody in the world to see. And uh, I think the reaction people have to a transcript or to going into a room and listening to something one-on-one -on -one is very different from the reaction that they have to the idea that this tape of a very sensitive uh, conversation is going to be on the web. So I, 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 uh, I'm with Norman, and one of the things I liked about the dissent in this decision was an, an effort to find a way to uh, provide for disclosure, for all the reasons disclosure is valuable, yet um, minimize the, the opportunity for uh, the entire world seeing something on the internet in its most raw emotional way. Um, let, let me correct um, uh, one thing uh, that's in the bulletin. I left Chadbourne and Park uh, at the end of 2011 and I now practice on my own. I have a very limited practice. I like to do pro bono work for those who have been wrongly convicted. Um, I taught um, New York criminal procedure for over 30 years at Fordham's Law School. And the last few years I taught constitutional law covering not only New York, the New York Constitution, but constitutions across the country. In the New York State Constitution, Bill of Rights is the first part of the Constitution. And it has three different provisions referring to uh, freedom of the press, speaking what you want to do, but it also says in effect, there are limits to that freedom, and uh, people can be sued and punished either by fine or imprisonment or both if they abuse that privilege. So um, I uh, think it's very good to um, have these things made public, but I certainly would redact them, and if a person person's family said nothing doing, I would, uh, I would adhere to that. And, and, and to follow up on the jobs off about pro bono, when we were in the fight with the city on the issue of the human remains and wanting to uh, get the city to, they had the list of everybody, but we had the names, but we didn't have the addresses. And we proposed initially that we would send the information out uh, or they could send it out, and the returned uh, envelopes would come back 
and then we realized, well, then we would know the addresses of all the people, so we proposed that an independent person would be the person who would receive all this information, someone who could be trusted. And the one judge who came forward and said, I'll do that for you, was George Bundy Smith. And uh, the, so he's not just talking the talk, he walks it as well. So thank you again, Your Honor, but not being perfect, right? <laughs> You know, one of the things that I hear in this conversation that I think is important to keep in mind is the question of who should be the editor or the ultimate gatekeeper. Um, in, uh, in the freedom of information context, the first possible gatekeeper is the government. Right? Then if you bring a, uh, a FOIA action in court, there's a possibility of a, a court, you know, a judge or judges in a panel being the editor. And another alternative, which I often see in the classic First Amendment context, is that you let the press, you know, you defer to the editorial judgment of the press. So uh, none of these editors are perfect. I only have this to say. The last person that I want making editorial decisions about what should be public or not public is the government with the exception of obviously national security where you have to do it. As a general principle, I think having the government decide um, what the public should know or shouldn't know is a bad idea. I think judges in an independent ju uh, judiciary, as Norman said, are better suited. But even there, um, I'm uncomfortable. So I come back to this notion that if I can't have a perfect system, which way I'm gonna, am I going to err? I'm going to err inside of, uh, in favor of more disclosure. And that means generally deferring. If somebody wants the document, they ought to have it, generally. Well, there. Part of the problem with the uh, Freedom of Information Law is New York. Freedom of In Information Act, FOIA, is the federal. And my experience, like the New York City Police Department, they're notorious. You send in a freedom of information request, you don't even get a response. They just ignore the law. Isn't that ironic? The people who are employed to uphold the law ignore the law in this area. There are other agencies. Fire department doesn't have a wonderful record either. You can send stuff to them, and even though it, they're supposed to respond in five days under the law, it never happens. So. It's frustrating in the sense that when you read the New York Freedom of Information Law, I think it's a beautiful document because it really sets forth the principles and values of an open democracy and that we the people have the right to have this information. And it makes the government employees what they really are, employees for us, by us and for us. But the application of the Freedom of Information Law is also very, very difficult. And very often when people call, many lawyers say, uh, it's just a waste of time, it's costly, we're not going to be able to get it. So the reality of what the law was supposed to be is not really where it is at this point. And uh, they've made some amendments to try to strengthen it. But the reality is, my experience, most people, especially government people, especially the elected officials, they don't want anyone knowing what they actually are doing because they do know that if we know everything that they're doing, they ain't going to come out looking so good. That's what it's all about, folks. Let, let me just uh, add to what I, I have said. I represent a woman who uh, has been convicted, spent 10 years in prison, for a crime she did not commit. Uh, when I was at Chadbourne in Park, I gave the 27 volumes uh, to summer interns. They all came back and said, this woman is innocent. I read the 27 volumes, uh, and I am convinced she's innocent. Why do I say that? Well, for one, the original death certificate said this guy uh, died by natural causes. Court order, they exhumed his body, and uh, the person who performed the autopsy said this guy died of natural causes. 
He was obese. He was a smoker. He had carcinoma of the liver. Um, he went in for a heart operation, and he did not come out alive. Jury never heard any of that. Never heard any of that, even though there's an obligation on the part of the prosecution to give that information to the defense. That's one case. Second case comes out of North Carolina. A person was convicted and sentenced to two life terms plus 30 years for crack cocaine as opposed to powdered cocaine. The uh, Congress of the United States, the Supreme Court of the United States have all said um, penalties for these two have to be substantially equal. By my calculation, the guy should have gotten less than five years in prison. He's been in prison since 1994 or 1995, and I'm still trying to get him out. I'll get him out eventually, but I shouldn't have to go through all of this to get him out. I would like all of the judges and their staffs sitting in past, or the legislators and their staffs sitting in past, all the governors and executives and their staffs sitting in present to indicate whether or not they ever uh, had used cocaine or used uh, marijuana. I say that, and I'm a person who never even smoked a marijuana cigarette, and the first time I saw cocaine, I was a judge in the court courtroom. But these two cases are just the tip of the iceberg. There are a lot of people sitting in prisons across the United States who should not be there. Okay, let me ask one question and then we'll throw it open uh, because we're getting short on time. Uh, from a Freedom of Information perspective, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of the National Transportation Safety Board. Um, and uh, they routinely you know, in the aviation environment, but also in other modes of transportation. Uh, they interview uh, personnel in, in aviation. There's live recordings of audio in, in aircraft and following an event that's just released as a matter of, of course. Uh, is there something similar? Uh, could you extrapolate that to the role of public safety? Um, you know, are this, is a police officer or a firefighter like an airline pilot? And maybe there should just be this uh, expectation uh, drawn around uh, just a, uh, you know, it's a, just a standard the thing that those, those kinds of records would be, have to be released uh, following some kind of an event. And I guess the follow-up of that would just be, is there, is there a legislative or a FOIL or FOIA reform agenda somewhere out there, or is it that the laws are good that are on the books, they're just not followed? Those records ought to be released, no question about it. They ought to be released automatically. I think the reason that sometimes they aren't released is because the employees are afraid that if they say something, they're going to be fired. And they should not be afraid. They should be protected. Now, a couple of years ago, 2010, I bought my last automobile, Ford Taurus beautiful car I had it made. But I'm so angry that if and when I get the money, I'm going to buy a Lincoln because I think a Lincoln may be safer. And uh, uh, well, that's, that's, that's my answer. Well, it, currently, the FOIL and FOIA laws, generally speaking, uh, that information should be made public. Uh, there are uh, 10 exceptions in the New York law, and we talked about some of them here. The privacy exemption, we've talked about great extent. There's uh, an exception for what's called uh, intra-agency uh, material, and the premise there is, is that if employees are writing memos and they're not in final form, 
that shouldn't be released because otherwise people won't give creative ideas that the boss rejects because they're afraid that it could affect their future. But if it's a final document, that's supposed to be released too. There's law enforcement exceptions. There's lots of different exceptions, but the, the premise, I think Dan did it right, it's a rebuttable presumption. That the presumption is, unless it's rebutted by one of these exceptions, is that the information should be made public. And the transportation safety is no exception uh, to the law. The problem, Charles hit it on its head, is that the application enforcement of the law, in my opinion, is not as vigorous as it should be. And I think, again, it goes back to the point that the people in positions of power don't necessarily want you to know. Take a look at the whole issue of cigarettes and the terrible medical consequences. For all those years, we've discovered people knew, but they didn't want it to be disclosed because it would affect the economics of the issue. I'm sure there are lots of other areas today that are similar where people who are making profit or people in power don't want the information to be disclosed because if it's disclosed, then there will be a problem. The, the mayors of New York, we had it with Giuliani and Bloomberg, we'll have it with everyone. As soon as they leave, they don't want the information to go to the archives. There's now, even with the cell phones, people in government, including officials in our state, where they will use their private cell phone rather than the government phones to have these kinds of political conversations. FOIL says there's no exception. If you're on your private phone and you're doing government business, that should be made public. And so we have to fight this all the time. And again, why are they doing that? Well, they go on their cell phone because they don't want it to be on the public phone because if it's on the public phone, they might have to disclose it. Well, we have to hold them accountable. Okay. Open up. Yeah, I'd like to take Just a give us your name, your social security number. <laughs> <laughs> What's your number? <laughs> I'd like to touch on something that Norman uh, said. Uh, you talked about a script, and you've got to go way back to understand what the city did and individuals pushing their own agenda. As you know, and I don't know how many people in the room know, what the city of New York did with the communication system. Now, it's been in the papers again in the last few weeks because the fire department is now making changes after all the hoopla about the uh, ambulances getting there very slowly and so on. New York City had five borough offices, dispatch offices, one in each borough. They were all closed and they were all put, all of the dispatches were put in one location in Brooklyn, centralized system. Sounds good. And then the city and the fire department pumped first tens of thousands of dollars into a system, a Star Wars, Star Wars system, if you want to call it, that was going to solve all the problems of dispatching. And it went on and on and on. And I, can, I can name about four people I know that worked on it for five to ten years, all retired, and the thing never got went anywhere. Still sitting. The dispatchers that are there have scripts. They are civilians. They have absolutely no knowledge of the police or fire, what they do, or EMS. Now, maybe some of them have been cross-trained, but by and large, they're just civilians. When they finally decide what issue it is, they will then turn it over to the police or the fire dispatch person. But it is not the same as when we had the old system where you had essentially buffs, fire buffs, who knew where the companies were, knew where the buildings are, knew everything. They could tell you more about the fire department than the chief of department could tell you. And they were the ones who were dispatching. And you didn't have these glitches where there were several minutes delay and so on and so forth. And these systems kept getting pushed to get a better system, which hasn't worked. And we talked about earlier, before you got here, about them being in the windowless building, which they still are. And yes, they've been trained and they've been updated, and the fire department has updated their system somewhat, but it's still not the same. If you're talking to a dispatcher who knows the situation, whether it be police, fire, EMS, whatever the case may be, 
These are the things that the city keeps pushing aside. Bloomberg continued to pump money into this system, and as you know, it went from one company to another. They, everybody pointed fingers at whoever it was that uh, had the, the, the initial installation of the system that didn't work. They were going to upgrade it, pump more money in, and on and on and on it goes. So here we are still stuck with the same system. We haven't improved on it. Maybe the scripts are better today. But remember, defending place, which Glenn can speak to in volumes, that's the way that we fight fires in high-rise buildings. I, myself, trained most of the uh, fire safety directors. For 22 years, I was an adjunct professor at NYU, training the fire safety directors. What did the fire safety directors do in the South Tower, and you know that for a fact, that when the people started to evacuate, they were told to go back because it was the other building that was hit. And some of them that said, no, I'm leaving, and they got out. Others went back, and they perished when the second tower fell, or when the, when the south tower fell, which was the first tower to fall. But they were doing their job. That's what we told them. That's what I trained people to do. Tell them to go two floors below the fire floor, and they're safe. And what was the dispatchers doing? Stay where you are. Somebody will get to you. Of course, that's what they were told, but they had no clue as to what was going on. You and I, as I said earlier, watching you on TV, you probably saw more than the dispatchers knew. So, yes, there were scripts. They've probably been updated. Uh, how further along are we? I don't know. I hope that we never have to find out, but I think that we need to keep pushing for this information to come out so that we can prevent anything like this in the future not only here in New York City, but anywhere in the country. Thank you. I actually have a, just a statement and then a question. I want to go back to what Daniel said, the hypothesis about that, um, you know, a phone call of the woman, you know, saying that she feels she's going to die and so on and so forth. Almost that exact type of phone call with the woman speaking to a 9-11, you know, dispatcher and saying that, you know, I'm going to burn, I'm going to die, and, and the dispatcher saying, no, 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 don't say that, you know. It's so emotional 13 years later. But, you know, that phone call, the federal government picked three of the most compelling phone calls both sides of it, to use in the Massawi trial to prove the government's case. And I know that because I attended the Massawi trial, and I was as close to Massawi as I am to you, except there was this massive New York City detective that was assigned to sit right next to me <laughs> on the end, okay? And that was all, you know, uh, because I guess they thought I was going to, uh, you know, speak out maybe, God forbid. Or, or do more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so it, it's troubling to me. I don't know the details of it. Did the government say to the family of this, this uh, young lady, you know, we, we need this, we're going to use it. Did they ask them if the family said, no, I don't want you to because I have a right of privacy? What would have happened there? Um, so I'm very troubled as a 9-11 family member that the government can decide, you know, to do what they want to do. They can say, no, no, there's a right of privacy and, and we can't have the, the information because we think it's going to help the rest of society. But they can take those, uh, those conversations and use it in the trial. I'm not against that, okay? But it... it but it, it really uh, hit home to me wh when you gave that. Now, the, the second thing that I want to say, ask a question is, um, you know, today we had a, a lot of, you know, kudos to our most honored guest, the judge, and I know that Norman Siegel has a tremendous amount of deep personal respect uh, for you, and I'm very grateful that you did agree to uh, be the recipient of this survey regarding the human remains. Of course, the city of New York squashed it, 
and the 9-11 museum squashed it. But I would like to ask you a question, you know, with all due respect, in a most respectful way. I just wanted to ask you, what was the reason that you really voted, you know, against, you know, what our group wanted as far as full disclosure of the 9-11 um, calls and uh, transcripts? Voted against... Um Give <laughs> the real reason is I state my reasons. I don't hide behind anything. I think there are times when privacy uh, trumps disclosure, and that was one of the times. The tapes could have been revealed, as in this uh, trial, I think they should have been revealed. That was a good reason and probably one of the main reasons why he was convicted. And others can still be convicted. But uh, if you have some reason for privacy, that personal message, uh, I'm going to uh, die, I love you, uh, this is the last thing I can uh, say to you. If a person wants that kept private, I think that's, that's private. Just got one quick question. Dan, um, Steve Gorlick asked earlier, could you just spend a couple minutes uh, about Newtown um, and talk about that? Because we really didn't talk about it much today. I will point out, by the way, Flight 93, that recording was never made public, by the way. So, um, so even though the NTSB got it, it never went public. So. Shanksville, right? Yeah, Shanksville. Right. Uh, sure, no, uh, so let me tell you. Uh, Anybody ask for it? People ask for it and you denied. Okay. So you were asking about the Newtown experience. So let me just disclose up front um, I am legal counsel, pro bono legal counsel to Governor Malloy's Sandy Hook Advisory Commission. This is a civilian commission set up after the tragedy much as one was set up after the Virginia Tech massacre, much as one was set up after the Columbine tragedy. And it's staffed by experts in mental health, uh, school security, and law enforcement. And I'm just an advisor. I'm not on the commission. Uh, but by virtue of that position, I've followed the situation closely. So what happened in Sandy Hook is, um, and this shows you how passions are, are ignited so quickly, within several hours, of the, of the public dissemination of, of the shooting, the AP did something which newspapers routinely do. There was nothing unusual about its request. It made a request for the 911 calls. And that infuriated um, the families in Sandy Hook for understandable reasons. Uh, it infuriated people who were close to the families and it led to a long legal battle over the disclosure of the 911 calls. And uh, the state's attorney who handled this case um, argued for various reasons that they shouldn't be disclosed. When the matter finally got to court, the judge, uh, and this is a word you do not hear too often from a judge in a written opinion, called the state's attorney's arguments borderline frivolous. That's a very serious thing for a judge to say, not only to an attorney, but to a state's attorney. The arguments were so weak that they were, they were virtually frivolous. And the 911 uh, tapes were released. And we heard the gentleman from WABC, I think, talk about them. Um, I particularly uh, closely connected with the media in Connecticut, and I know that many uh, folks struggle with the decision to publish them, not to publish them, should we put them on our website, should we redact them, and there are a, a range of decisions. Some people put them up entirely, others uh, put up uh, redacted parts, um, but the world did not come to an end. And here's the interesting thing. The argument that had been made for the many months this issue was being litigated was that the reason the 9-1 tapes should not be released is because 
you're probably going to hear a telephone call by a teacher who was trapped in a room as Adam Lanza came by, and you were going to hear words like, he's coming, he's coming, oh my God, he's shooting, he's killing, and then, all right? That was the fear, that you would hear real-time, live, emotional reports of somebody as he or she was about to be shot and perhaps killed by Adam Lanza. Turns out, none of the calls had anything like that. Not like that. What they revealed was the, the hero, uh, heroism of a custodian who helped guide the police and first responders and tell them where Adam appeared to be and where in the building he was and the, and the heroism of teachers who were guarding their students. Um, is it possible? Sure. There are 911 calls, not in, in the Newtown case, where you hear dying words of somebody, and, and that's terrible. Um, but the 911 calls ultimately were released, but not without a very, very big fight, as I said, by the state's attorney, and also an e a legislative effort. The, the families um, were, uh, again, ignited by a false rumor started on Fox News that Michael Moore, the filmmaker, uh, left, you know, liberal left-wing filmmaker, was going to make a FOIA request for the homicide photographs, you know, the crime scene photographs of the children at Sandy Hook. That was not true at all. If you look at what he said, he did not say he was going to make a request. But it led to this frenzy, and the, the families and their supporters came to the legislature and said, we want you to immediately amend the Connecticut Freedom of Information Act to bar the disclosure of crime scene photographs, to bar the disclosure of 911 calls. And then the state's attorney, uh, not the particular one I was talking about before, but the office in general jumped on the bandwagon. There were a lot of things that they for years wanted to keep from the public. And they joined in with this legislative frenzy and they were successful. So at the end of 2013, a bunch of exemptions were added to the FOIA. And then, finally, the media and the open government folks uh, that, that I'm affiliated with started pushing back. And over the course of a year, there was a tremendous dialogue in Connecticut, very much like the one we're having today, about the pros and the cons and what are the values of having this information, what are the costs of having this information. And a compromise was struck, not an ideal one. 911 calls are back to being disclosed. Homicide photographs, can't, of minor victims cannot be disclosed. Um, some other information that was, uh, that was exempt is not exempt anymore. And that's the way it struck out. The lesson that I've learned from this that I'd like to impart to everybody is that it is almost impossible to make good public policy in the immediate wake of a tragedy like Sandy Hook or a tragedy like 9-11. Uh, um, there needs to be some distance. And I wish that uh, our elected representatives uh, would get this message and not uh, have the knee-jerk reaction, which is completely understandable. From a human perspective, what I saw happen in Connecticut makes absolute sense. You can understand why people were trying to protect the families from further trauma but you don't want to make public policy in that environment. What you do need is the information to come out so that when, when the emotions reside, uh, uh, not reside, but uh, what's the word? Calm down a bit, well, when there's a little bit more perspective. You have the information, you have clear thinking, and then you can make decisions about how to go. Now, as time goes on and my experience on at least 9-11 through this battle, I'm more and more convinced that those tapes need to be released because when they're not released, the problem and the systemic problem bringing about those tragedies continue. You know, to the people in Connecticut at that situation, people need to go in and explain that unless that information gets out, the gun laws are continue to be as bad as they are in America. And people who should not have guns are going to have guns. 
and this stuff will be repeated again and again, and we've seen that's exactly what's happened. Uh, so perhaps the shock and the language that the courts use about pain and embarrassment, maybe that needs to be out there for us to change the systemic problems, because otherwise it happens again and again. On the 9-11 stuff, again, as I was thinking last night in preparation for here, uh, the government, without any evidence, took the position that except for the eight families, two of which are here today, the Centauras and the Reagan Hearts, without any evidence, they took the position that these other families did not want this information to be released. There's no evidence of that. No one ever polled them. No one ever asked them. And in the current fight with the Centauras and the Reagan Hearts and other people, they've actually gone on record and said if the government asked the families what they wanted to do with the human remains, if a majority of the family said keep it 70 feet below, they would abide by that. And yet, that still never happened. So, you know, the idea when the tragedy occurs and you're saying give it some time, I'm a now of the other position. I want to go in immediately and talk to people about, look, we can't bring back your loved one. But what mainly we can do now is we can take this horrible situation and present it to the American public with the aim of trying to make sure that we ameliorate these kinds of tragedies or possibly even eliminate them. And without the American support, because what happens is it's fickle. Even 9-11, as horrific as it was, people move on. The families live with it for the rest of their lives. And yet, we didn't make the reforms that were needed. Uh, we can spin it in some ways, but the reality is it could happen again. And uh, in Sandy Hook, we didn't make the reforms. It is happening again, maybe not on that magnitude. But I pick up the paper, we hear about it every other week. Someone who shouldn't have a gun, especially if they have mental health problems, how do they get guns? Why isn't there screening? Why isn't someone doing it? Because they want to make money off this stuff? We have to start putting human life more important than economic greed. We, uh, in the exigencies of time, we must move on. And, uh, you know, the things uh, that it's going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you, I've got to end this panel uh, and uh, get us to the point where we can uh, have our uh, summary remarks and then leave a few minutes because we do have to be out of the room at 4, which is 20 minutes from now. We can uh, always have a sit-in. But, sit but I want to thank <laughs> – well, that's true. We don't – we're only going to be put out, I guess, if they put us out, Norman. But uh, we, we need a I'll couple of lawyers you. to defend, defend us, though. Defend so I just want to uh, thank this panel, and I, I here at the College of, of Criminal Justice. You know, the the really, uh, I think it speaks to your your passion, your expertise to make the discussion of law so salient and uh, so relevant to us. And uh, I think it's you know uh, it's really to talk about the Constitution. And uh, to see these issues, I think it's 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 very uh, inspiring. So I want to thank you for that. Um, we're going to go straight to uh, Steve Gorlick, who's who basically is going to give basically a, a summary of a fast summary, but it'll be good, knowing Steve. And then we will revert to questions. And then the panelists, I think we can probably just stay where we are, and we can just pass the mic around and talk. I promise to be. Uh, am I on? Yes. I promise to be very quick. But um, I actually do have some, I think, some th quick themes that did come up today that I wanted to make sure that, that we sort of uh, leave with. Um, the first thing, though, I wanted to say is something that I've never been able to say before uh, to family members uh, of victims. Um, I've been... Uh, I was in Spain I was speaking to the surviving family members of the Atocha bombing. I was in uh, Norway working with the family members of the Otoya massacre on Otoya Island. And I've been to so many conferences where these issues are discussed. I want you to know that I was thinking, I've never been to a meeting where these issues were ever discussed in a sort of impersonal, in an impersonal way. 
every conference I've ever been to, when there's no members of family present, has always been handled, the people, the scholars working in this area, with never in vain, always with an awareness of the young people and not so young people who were lost that day. It's always on the minds of people. And like I say, when people are not, it's not, when people are not present, there's such a, scholars can be critical, but there's such a reverence and care about what we know is behind why we do what we do. Uh, and I just thought back to meetings everywhere where it, it, it never gets into the social science of thinking of ag people as like numbers or aggregates. It's just, it's always this way. I've never, never been to a meeting that was other. Um, just a couple themes. First of all, again, uh, it's clear that we um, heard a lot about the supposed tension between trauma uh, and truth. And uh, I think that this was an excellent day to sort of, to sort of dismantle the idea that there is some clear choice that has to be made between either revealing truth or traumatizing people. I think today really revealed just how complicated it is. Uh, and, as, and I think all, while we often, most of us came out on the side of more truth and more in, information, um, I think that all the, from the first panel to the last, no one was unaware that those have to be balanced with very real uh, traumatic concerns about things that are released that might be traumatic to individuals. Um, um, uh, Daniel Klaus talking about erring in one direction is really the best we can do. But the idea that you gotta, that, that governments often propose that you have to choose between trauma because uh, we want to protect the families and truth it's just, it, that's not the dichotomy that has to be made. In fact, it's a much more complex thing that where, where, where equities can be balanced. Um, um, uh, just very quickly, I was a scholar in residence for a year at the uh, United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. And um, I was interviewing a Holocaust survivor. Um, and it's a very, it's touchy. And um, the person I had a very good relationship with told me something that they experienced which could not have happened to them. In other words, I knew that their memory was reporting to me something that they were in a certain place where they couldn't have been. That was a real a moment for me because I realized just all at this moment, the whole, this whole speech went through my head. This person has developed a narrative to live for the rest of their life. That narrative included putting them in a certain place at a certain time. Was I there to do an oral history that had some scholarly purpose? Yes. Did I say something to them? No. Uh, I have no problem erring on the side of trauma against full open disclosure and truth sometimes. It's just no problem doing that. But it's neither is it something that, that, as governments would claim, we have to sort of protect, protect, protect people from. Um, I have to say, uh, the next theme I wanted to call people's attention to is today more than ever is this continuing theme that comes up in a lot of the conferences here at John Jay. The notion of what it means to be a first responder is changing by the minute. In fact, the term is almost the term is almost uh, obsolete. Um, um, when, when Al Santora talked about people on TV having a better view uh, of things, um, uh, and the press panel talked about um, uh, that, you know, we're often first responders too. Um, first responders rarely now arrive at the scene of any sort of a major high profile incident without people, hundreds of people with cameras already being there. And remember, these smartphones we have. For those of you who are old like me, you're, we're holding in our hands the equivalent of an entire 1960 television station, the whole station. Um, and it's just, it, it's, a, it's a new world and uh, the idea of who is a first responder and what it means to be a first responder and how first responders have to learn to adapt to live in a world where they will arrive on the scene with the film of the incident already being broadcast. <laughs> which I've discovered in my study, I'm doing a lot of work in, the, in how Twitter uh, broadcasts the nature of events. It's just a new world. Um, 
Um, I remember, I think Al said something about um, that there was some um, confusion about whether the building was tilting or not and whether the people inside found out about and this, this whole issue. Just yesterday I was telling, a, I have a graduate class at Hunter College called uh, Disaster in Media and Culture and I was showing um, the students live news coverage from about 8.45 to 9.30. And uh, I found it interesting that you mentioned this issue of the building tilting because just yesterday I noticed for the first time, because I sort of tune out a little bit because I was closer than I wished to the events. Um, Matt Lauer at about 9.20 says, wait a minute, the building's tilting and that's not the, that's not the, um, that's not the, the lens from the long distance lens. I see that, you know. So it, it is a world in which a lot of times now the press it may not be the physical first responder, but they're certainly uh, often the, 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 first, the, the first to see. The next quick point is, and this is really galling because I go back a long ways with Glenn about this, is how hard it is to change policies and protocols the longer that time passes. I just want to make the point is, I have always thought that this is a special problem for fire and building codes. Um, Glenn Corbett once, we were talking about this and he says, you know Steve, getting the public interested in fire codes and building codes is like getting them interested in paint drying. I never forgot that you said that. Um, and we live in a society that's sort of a social problems marketplace where every issue fights for its place in the sun. Um, and I just have to say that the issue of fires and explosions as causes of death, from what I know about how the public does or does not get interested in fire regulations, does, and, and from what I think I know about how public opinion loses interest quickly in those things, I think we're about to, that we're starting a period where we can expect a cyclical following cycle. Uh, there'll be a, a social club fire or a fire in a building that was inadequately, that was not following a, a fire regulations or inadequately inspected or uh, whatever. People will die. The politicians will trip over each other to propose panels, commissions, and all sorts of laws. Nothing will be done, and then we'll wait, and there'll be the next social club fire. I, and, and I'll move on, but I'll tell you, I have given that, that's how I've opened that class every semester for almost 25 years now. Uh, one fire after another, one mass casualty after event, and this issue just never seems to permeate the public consciousness to a point. And it, bo it bothers me because my son's a U.S. diplomat and I visit him in various countries he works at. And you know, when I land in the United States, I look at all the houses. Maybe I'm the only guy who does this. I look down at the ground and I say, after being in other countries, thank God for building codes and fire codes. Uh, anyway, um, one, uh, another quick point. There's a real, there is a success story in releasing tapes that, I want, that nobody mentioned today. And it's worth a listen to. And I know there was an effort to get, that was hard to get these tapes released. Dean John Farmer of the Rutgers Law School uh, published an article in the Rutgers Law Review called FAA and NORAD, A New Kind of War. Dean Farmer is a relatively new dean at Rutgers Law School. He was on the 9-11 Commission. And what he published was a, pardon? Yes. Um, what he published was uh, a detailed annotation, including the, the, uh, the tapes, of every air traffic control uh, communication from the very beginning in the morning in Boston for the next four or five hours. Both sides of the conversation in which all sorts of ex just in quintessentially human mistakes are revealed. Uh, they could not be more useful to people trying to understand how decision making takes place and how people work. They couldn't be more useful and because I was pretty seriously ill about a month ago. I was incapacitated and I listened to all the hours of it. And I just, I just would say that it's an example of what you learn when there's nothing taken out. And I know the problems of taking things out. What you learn is the exact moments when, the, when misperceptions and, mis and mistakes are passed along that, 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 that were correct at one point and then with one little word, they become switched to a mistake 
and, and, and that's, you learn incredibly important things about human, uh, about, uh, about uh, human decision making and so on. Um, one other quick point is, if I can, um, I think that um, bureaucracies are always going to be self-protective. And they're always going to have guys like me 30 years ago who was in the position of writing for an elected official, various, you know, spin statements and CYA statements. I didn't do it very long, but even one of the journalists who was on the panel once caught me and pointed it out in the paper. I'm glad he's not here anymore. <laughs> Uh, I, I've, I've, I've sought uh, forgiveness for those years. Um, but, but what I was going to say is we really have to rethink, with all the self-protectiveness, the concept of error. We really have to sort of rethink how we view the notion of error. And a, we need a fundamental change uh, uh, in our willingness to see error as an opportunity to learn. Um, uh, I have to say something. It's not only public officials that are self-protective, if I could. It is often the public is extraordinarily impatient with public officials. And sometimes it's very hard for uh, public officials uh, to, to, uh, to, 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 to resist this kind of a pressure. All I'm trying to say is that there's a great literature, there's a book called, by Alina Tujin called Better by Mistake, The Benefit of Being Wrong, of all the things you learn from, from wrong things last... Oh, the last thing is, we learned a lot today about the public-private distinction, about the, you know, and I just want to uh, just make a, an obvious point about what should be public and what should be private. Um, just how much 9-11 presented, not only with these 9-11 tapes, but in all sorts of other ways, that day presented all sorts of privacy issues. You might remember that there were all sorts of photos of trinkets that were published, of wallets, of necklaces, uh, without any thought to the fact that the people whose family members they were would almost certainly re figure out who they were, uh, belonged to. Uh, that privacy issue came up. The issue came up of, of, of who was this man falling, the famous falling man, and, and when newspapers that publishes. And, that, and I think that came up. The only point I want to make about this is that I think it's just important, and I don't like to admit this because I grew up in the time when there still was a private realm. I just want to make the point that for good or bad, an enormous amount of what we used to see as the private realm is simply gone. It's just, it's just gone. Um, um, and it's gone because most of the stuff that we think was private and is now was never private in the first place. It was de facto private because it was inaccessible. You know what I mean? And now with new technologies, there's an enormous amount of stuff that's public, but it was never private. You know, as I tell my students, all I hope is that the California State Juvenile Records <laughs> remain <laughs> private. <laughs> Uh, I wasn't that bad, but just there's something there, you know. Uh, so uh, the, the point I'm trying to make is that the extent to which technology and this new world has rendered a lot of notions of what is private really antiquated. And I may miss them. You may miss them. I may miss that we once had a president who, could, who was paralyzed, but, and we didn't know about it. But it's gone. Those years, those days are gone. So there's some things, no matter what we want to do, are always going to be uh, are always going to become um, going to become public. Um, so thank you. This is my attempt to, to sum up some things, and to be able to again to say to the families that I've never been to an academic meeting when this issue has been treated with anything other than reverence and concern and awareness that real lives were involved, not just statistics. I know it's the end of the day, so thank you for sticking around. Uh, in the interest of reality, what we're going to do is if you have questions, you can uh, seek out the uh, panelists one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, we're going to mill around. Uh, you can get one last shot at the coffee and soda and uh, consider the day adjourned. It's been a remarkable day. I want to thank all of our panelists. I want to thank the co-sponsoring organizations. 
of the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism, the Academy for Critical Incident Analysis, the Crime and Justice and uh, whatever the hell else center, and the Center on Terrorism. Uh, and thank all of you most of all for uh, coming and uh, sticking with us. I forgot we're on tape. And uh, so thank you everybody. And it's been a great day. And there will be proceedings from this event. Uh, if you uh, came in to sign up today, make sure we have your email. You can see uh, someone in the back and then we'll notify you when, when those proceedings are available. So uh, seek out the, uh, the speakers for your questions. We'll also have a podcast. Right? And, and yeah, uh, we'll, and we'll eventually we'll have an edited uh, portions of this will be available as well. So thank you very much for coming.